You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in the nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday the 13th of February. Hertfordshire Crime Commissioner calls BNP racist. Staffordshire Police doubles child exploitation team. Muslim fanatics use fringe stations to call for terror, murder and torture. Only 15 of 200 foreigners who took part in the 2011 riots have been deported. 74-year-old woman must pay a thousand euros to amnesty. The far left and the attempted assassination of Lars Hedegaard. The Pope retires. Ten Afghans killed in NATO airstrike. Kabul urged to protect sexually abused children. Thought for the day, a dark side of England. And finally, a very wise owl. UK News. Hertfordshire Crime Commissioner calls BNP racist. The Daily Mail reported that newly elected Tory Crime Commissioner for Hertfordshire sparked outcry after tweeting Hitler picture calling for socialists to embrace their inner Nazism. Dr Rachel Frosch, who earns £20,000 a year, helping to run Hertfordshire Police, retweeted, Dear Socialists, embrace your inner Nazism, it said alongside a Hitler image, and compared modern socialists with Hitler's Nazis. After being forced to apologise to the, quote, socialists, end quote, in the Labour and Tory parties, she went on to say, Basically what I'm saying is that any racist party is not anything to do with any mainstream party. When the BBC talk about the BNP as far right, it's upsetting to the people on the right of centre as they are outside anything on the right. Their views are unacceptable, full stop. As part of her apology, this incompetent Harridan tweeted, I've just taken down a retweet about a comparison with socialist and national socialists. I don't agree that Nazis stroke BNP are socialists. Both BNP and Nazis are racist parties that should not be considered right-wing or left-wing, just racist. It appears this lady doth protest too much. A World Date reporter states, After all, the BNP are the only party with a constitution that passes both the courts and the EHRC test for being non-racist. And update, this woman has now resigned. Staffordshire Police doubles child exploitation team. The BBC report that a rise in reports of child sexual abuse has prompted Staffordshire Police to double the size of its child exploitation team. The specially trained team is now 14 strong, with two detective sergeants and 12 detective constables. Detective Sergeant Mark Stratton said, we're increasing the size of our team to deal with those reports effectively. Stoke-on-Trent-based charity Savannah took on 255 new cases of child sex abuse last year. Justine Early Dunn from the charity said, Grooming and childhood sexual abuse is a bigger problem than people realise. Lots of people don't come forward, so we know that for those we do know, there's a lot of people hidden behind that. Although this is great news, what is worrying is the rise in number of abuse cases that are coming to light nationwide. What is most worrying, though, is the lack of prosecution in relation to reported incidents. According to the Office of National Statistics, figures over the past six years, 53,665 incidents of child sexual offences have been reported to police forces in England and Wales and over the same period there have been 9,919 criminal prosecutions. This presenter, speaking for Profan, the non-political arm of the BNP, says this means only 18% of child sexual offences are ever prosecuted. How many are actually ever convicted? From my experience, many people are ashamed to be involved in these cases, and they should be more worried about not being involved. No one can do anything unless these cases are reported and, more importantly, followed through to prosecution. Also, if you note, the main perpetrators of sexual grooming, the Muslims, are totally ignored. Food adulteration hits further suppliers. The Independent reports that police and food hygiene officers raided and shut down the Peter Body Slaughterhouse in Todd Morton, West Yorkshire, and Farm Box Meats, a meat processing plant in Aberystwyth, North Wales, 
As part of an inquiry into the adulteration of beef products with horse meat, Dr. Mark Wolf, a former head of food authenticity at the FSA, claimed that the major shift in UK meat production, ordered at short notice by the European Commission, was at the root of the horse meat scandal. Last year, Brussels abruptly banned the use of desinued meat, DSM, the scraps recovered from animal carcasses after the prime cuts had been removed. DSM has long been a major part of the supply chain for British meat products. The move left suppliers 48 hours in which to look for alternative sources of cheap meat. This forced them to look abroad, where supply chains were not so well regulated. Even grand old dame Waitrose has been engulfed in the food scandals. Waitrose has withdrawn its essential British frozen meatballs after pork was detected in two batches. A World Date writer comments, I do feel sorry for our Islamic friends who may have eaten Waitrose meatballs. Actually, no more so than I feel sorry for the Brits who don't get to choose to eat halal killed meat. Accrington, Lancashire. Armed Asian gangs fight on Victoria Street. Two gangs of Asian men brandishing hammers and knives clashed on the streets of Accrington, Lancashire as an argument that started in the gym spilled outside. Detective Sergeant Julie Cross of Accrington CID said it was a nasty incident. She said the two men injured were in the group of three. One was badly assaulted with a machete and the other was punched. This is an incident where young lads have been out fighting in the street in the evening with weapons. Fortunately, no one else seems to have been seriously injured. It seems like a bit of an argument that may have started in the gym. It's not honour-based, it's not a community issue, but they do all seem to know each other. We're looking for any witnesses who may have seen something on the street at that time to contact police on 101. Muslim fanatics use fringe stations to call for terror and murder and the torture of gay people. Hardline Islamic extremists are using fringe British TV channels to call for terrorism, murder and the torture of homosexuals. A series of little-known channels has been severely criticised for allowing inflammatory material to be broadcast. Among the cases is an Islamic scholar who told viewers that it is their duty to kill those who insult the Prophet Muhammad. In another, a woman presenter said homosexuals should be beaten and tortured for the evil, shameful act. Ofcom, the communications watchdog, found the stations broke the broadcasting code by allowing the extreme opinions to be aired unchallenged. But the breaches highlighted fears that extreme Muslim speakers, previously confined to mosques, could reach larger audiences. Only 15 of 200 foreigners who took part in 2011 riots have been deported. Only 15! More than 200 cases were passed to the UK Border Agency after ministers promised to get tough on those who were arrested over the looting and arson attacks which brought misery to English cities. However, the vast majority have not been removed due to EU legislation and human rights laws, while there are fears more will be given permission to stay. A nationalist spokesman stated, We know where our government's priorities really lie. They cannot be bothered to get rid of the criminal scum who ran amok in our capital and other cities. European News French MPs approve gay marriage bill. Bill passed in lower house of parliament by 329 votes to 229 and this bill now goes to the Senate. A 74 year old woman must pay a thousand euros to Amnesty International for collecting petitions against a mosque. Maria Frank, a 74-year-old woman who leads an organisation called Association for the Future of Germany, peacefully gathers signatures calling for a referendum on whether an Islam in Europe centre should be built in Munich. She is constantly mobbed by Antifa, Green and trade union activists, so her placards are hardly visible. Despite that, she has been prosecuted for incitement to hatred. In Rotkreuzplatz, the 74-year-old pensioner exhibited a placard which, amongst other things, said that after the siege of Vienna by the Ottoman Empire in 1683, now the arrogant Turks and Muslims are threatening Europe again. The accused thus established and suggested the reference to a war of aggression, at least implicitly accepting that fear of Islam and Turks will be generated, argued the state prosecutor. She thus disturbed the public peace. Maria Frank was given a warning and ordered to pay a thousand euros to Amnesty International. 
She said she doesn't like this organisation and asked to be allowed to pay the money to a charity for persecuted Christians instead. The judge said no, it had to go to Amnesty International. In addition, the judge warned Frank, who has made numerous negative statements about Turks and Muslims on the internet, sometimes in a much more drastic way than on the placard, you need to stop that and become aware of what is acceptable and what isn't. Prosecutors wanted her thrown in jail for 90 days for speaking out against Islam, but the judge gave her three years probation and a fine of a thousand euros, payable to the Muslim advocates of Amnesty International for her hostile attitude towards Muslims, a charge that equals sedition in Germany. A World Date writer comments, Sounds like the German justice system is taking lessons from our English magistrates. Maria Frank is receiving the same style justice as Margaret Walker received in Ferrum. The far left and the attempted assassination of Lars Hedegaard. The participation of far right groups in stirring up hate crimes is rightly and often written about. Less noted is the way in which the far left demonizes figures with whom it disagrees. Amongst other things, they have compiled a helpful list of top dozen players in what they call their counter-jihad report. That top dozen list includes the ex-leftist American conservative David Horowitz, the Dutch politician Gert Wilders and a number of bloggers. It also includes Lars Hedegaard. Among the list of reasons Hope Not Hate give for including Hedegaard in their list is the fact that he is founder and president of the Danish Free Press Society. A nationalist spokesperson states, On the very same day that assassins knocked on Lars Hedegaard's door and attempted to shoot him, Hope Not Hate were running a day-long conference investigating the counter-jihad movement. Draw your own conclusions about whether Hope Not Hate it is really Hate Not Hope. World News Pope retires Pope Benedict XVI has thanked the public for their love and prayers as he made his first public appearance since announcing his resignation. The Pope was cheered by crowds as he entered and began speaking at a weekly audience in a hall at the Vatican. He said he resigned for the good of the Church, aware of his own declining spiritual and physical strength. He held his last public Mass in St. Peter's Basilica today, Ash Wednesday. Ten Afghans killed in NATO airstrike. A NATO airstrike killed 10 Afghan civilians, including five children, in eastern Afghanistan on Wednesday, local officials said. A toll that, if confirmed, is likely to raise tensions between President Hamed Karzai's government and the US-led NATO forces. But four Taliban insurgents were also reportedly killed in the strike. Kabul urged to protect sexually abused children. Radio Free Europe is reported that as a number of street children in Afghanistan grows, more and more children are exposed to the risk of sexual abuse. They cite the case where a 13-year-old boy has been convicted and jailed for having sex in a park with two adult men, the latest case of a victim of a sexual crime being punished in Afghanistan. Brad Adams, Human Rights Watch Asia's director, has said, when a man has sex with a 13-year-old child, the child is a victim of rape, not a criminal offender. Human Rights Watch quoted an Afghani prosecutor involved in the case as saying that the boy was prosecuted because he had consented to have sex with several men. The men were also arrested and charged with moral crimes, but the outcomes of their cases are not known. A World Date writer says, This is what we can expect in Britain as our Muslim population grows. It will be the victims of the grooming scandals who will be sent to jail, and not the perpetrators, if Islam is allowed to dominate Britain and Europe. Thought for the day. A dark day for us Brits. Welcome back to my listeners after our absence Monday, but honey, I'm home. My thought today is one of sorrow for the change in our own very British culture and our relationship to the animal world, and those innocents amongst us, namely children and the near carking in brigade, our own silver foxes. In his speech at the SE region, our chairman Nick Griffin, MEP, highlighted the huge difference immigration and propaganda has made to several generations of our children and their expectations of England, well, where they're allowed to have them, that is. I will talk about them on Friday. First, I will talk about our animal kingdom, both wild and domestic. 
There have been several hysterical reports of man-eating urban foxes, and a poor little baby had his finger bitten off in the latest rant. Now, firstly, how come these animals get into houses? In my knowledge of foxes, they avoid houses like the plague, even in towns, so they must be very, very hungry to tackle the unknown in this way. The RSPCA is coming under fire for suggesting that people put out food for them, and I think this is unfair. We waste, in this country, more food than we eat. So if there is spare or unwanted food, give it first to a food bank for the poor, or if just waste food, put it out for urban foxes. I fed whole families of foxes and badgers in my last house for 15 years, and I never had one of my cats attacked, or had the house entered into by an urban fox. And more importantly, neither did my neighbours with young children. If animals are forced out of their habitat and cannot hunt for food, what do you expect them to do? Not for them, the local supermarket or a gun to kill with. They have to go where they can, and in some cases, it is unfortunately the nearest completely open house with a baby alone in an obviously accessible room. We do not need to cull badgers. More diseases, both animal and human related, are brought in by immigrants and migrants than badgers put together, and never checked, let alone rooted out and culled, or rather killed, because that is what happens to badgers for bovine TV. The very sad fact is that nowadays we are not a nation of animal lovers. We have become too greedy and too accommodating to foreign cultures and money to really call ourselves that any more. We are, however, a long way off from the third world and their treatment of their working animals. But we are almost as bad in so far as we actually breed good cattle over here and in Ireland and send them overseas to be slaughtered by those mainly of the Muslim religion. Now this barbarous practice has been foisted on the unfortunate farmers who may or may not agree with this method of disposing of their young cattle because of greed and desperation. Desperation because our farmers do not get the sort of money they should get, either for dairy produce, meat or arable farming from the kings of money, the supermarkets, who, let's face it, rule our populace with an iron fist, or indeed various successive governments. Cows who are kept permanently either pregnant or lactating have their baby bulls killed at birth, or taken away and shipped out to Bahrain or some other godforsaken country to be butchered, and I mean butchered in every sense that word entails. There is a petition going round called A Dark Day for Ireland, because they are shipping out live young bulls for slaughter to Libya, that hellhole of Islamic jihadism. Some details I'm going to read you might not like, but you know me, what I can stand, you as my listeners can stand. The Irish government has given its full support to the resumption of live export trade with the Agriculture Minister, Mr Coveney, describing it as progress. The re-emergence of this trade after ten years would be a disaster for animal welfare and the reputation of Irish farming. The journey by boat from Ireland to Libya could take ten days, not including the journey to Waterford Port and the onward journey to Libya. Animals suffer terribly during long journeys. But for these animals, the end of the journey will bring no relief. Slaughter conditions in much of North Africa are frequently inhumane, with completely unacceptable practices being commonplace. At the same time, Ireland is currently President of the Council of the European Union, and as part of this role, they hold the presidency of the EU Agricultural Council. Long journeys are stressful for animals and can include deprivation of food and water, lack of rest, poor handling by humans, overcrowding, insufficient headroom, stress caused by noise and vibration, and then the cruel slaughter procedure. Previous compassion investigations into slaughter conditions in North Africa and the Middle East have found animals being roughly, even brutally handled, animals dragged into the place of slaughter, cruel methods of handling, e.g. the leg tendons of live cattle being severed with a knife to control them. Now, it's well known I'm an animal lover, and the Islamic way of handling animals and killing them is abhorrent to me, as I'm sure it is to most indigenous Brits, and the terrible stories of the wholesale killings of Eid are beyond awful, even if you're not an animal lover or a down-to-earth farmer or a country person. They are unnecessary and feed the basic dark side of the human character. And yet we in the UK, and I'm including Ireland here, sent our animals to their terrible deaths alive. For years, the Australians have been sending live sheep and lambs to the Arab states to supply them with more martyrs on the hoof, and we've been sending our cattle and sheep as well for these bastards to kill 
in the name of an alien religion, as for me, they are British Christian animals. We need our animals in our country for our people, which is bad enough when you look at battery farms with chickens and turkeys that have been forced upon us because of the huge amount of new people on this island. Most of our food problems will go away if we left the EU and stopped immigration dead. By the time we had sorted out new anti-halal laws and deported the criminal faction, we will be in an even better state to overhaul our farms and fit a more self-sufficient pattern and hopefully a more humane and profitable ones for the farmers. With the price of haulage and petrol, these guys, who would obviously sell their own mothers for money, must be making a hell of a lot of profit to cover just that, let alone the third world idiots they hire to terrorise the cattle and sheep in transit, and this is before they leave the white cliffs of Dover or the green hills of Eyre. It was in Southern Ireland, I believe, that around 25 years ago when I was there, that Ireland was the first country to host a halal chicken factory, because with the laws existing then in Northern Ireland and the troubles, the Muslims didn't want to set up there. I was disgusted then, and I'm disgusted now, at this attitude we in the UK have of putting up and shutting up over what should be a subject close to any Englishman's heart, animals and possible food. I'm also not one for the very upper-class habit of shooting everything in sight for sport. Now, if or when we're starving, then yup, it's permissible. But to raise poor little grouse chicks in a small barn and then send them out for a taste of freedom to be shot at doesn't sit well with me. But then I'm a woman, London-born, and an animal lover, so one who pleads they are country-born can rant on as far as I'm concerned. Talk to the hand, this face ain't listening. Now, the one person I know who was country-born and shot at anything worth shooting at shot a hare once. It was only wounded, and in his words it cried like a baby. So much so he took it to a vet to treat, and when it recovered, he let it loose in the country and never shot at anything again. A man after my own heart. On the other side of the scale, I knew a fellow who had been Prince Philip's equerry, done a tour of Northern Ireland. To say he was damaged was kind, but he still took his two young sons out regularly into his mother's grounds to shoot small birds, not even the edible kind. Why? Do people think because they kill animals they're superhuman or very well bred? But back to the way we treat our animals. We should stop sending any live meat or even packed meat to the Islamic countries. They have enough money to raise their own poor cattle and sheep. And if someone says they live in a desert so they can't, what did they do before we came along with our purses hanging out? I will tell you, they kill camels. And I love camels. They're creatures of great character, and if I win the lottery, I'm opening a camel farm along with a pig farm in Wiltshire. One of the saddest sights I saw just outside Cairo a few years ago was a small open truck packed with baby camels. We all went, ah, until a seasoned traveller told us they were all going to slaughter. Probably another sodding Eid sacrifice. Our farming industry, such as it is, is totally at the beck and call of rich foreigners or the EU, and I don't know which is the more damaging to us or our country or our livestock. Tesco and the horse meat is just the tip of the iceberg. Despite the awful jokes, I have eaten horse meat in Italy, where that seems to be all they do eat, passed off a steak, and believe me, it wasn't beef. I also love horses, noble and hard-working animals that they are. It seems just right that the main horse meat manufacturer is in Romania and is called Roma Slaughterhouse. And these are the people we've opened our country to and who will flood in again next year. Thousands of UK horses are sent live to these places to be killed in France and Italy. Horses should not be bred for food. They should be bred for racing, shows and domestic use. Horse meat is yet another Euro fad which should not make it out of Europe. I don't know the Muslim stance on eating horses, but the thought of a large horse bleeding out, alive and standing, does me no good at all. I also don't know the Jewish stance on eating horse, but Tesco is Jewish run and clearly has no qualms when it comes to making money from Eastern European market over it. Apparently it's all down to the nasty EU Parliament and their new rules for what we should or should not eat. I received an interesting little tome yesterday and I'll read you a portion of it that relates to our animals and farming. It encapsulates how the EU has ruined, or is in the process of ruining, our British farming industry. Let's face it, the Europeans have never had a good name for animal husbandry, so why should they care about ours? I quote, EU grants are given to farmers not to grow food, while thousands starve and the UK government are told to stabilise the market, which in reality is just for further control and manipulation in their greed for that total control to continue. EU fertilisers enforced on UK farmers 
which are destroying our environment and wildlife, which I was shown well over 12 years ago from various farmers. The powers that be didn't realise or care at the time the disastrous effect they would have on our humble bumblebee and what it would do to our UK worldwide food chain. Those same fertilisers shown to me again by those farmers deliberately caused foot and mouth to further destroy the farming industry so they can develop large battery dairy herds. It's well known main members of various governments have their own organic farm foods delivered directly so they do not have to endure what they deliberately enforce upon UK society. Now the foot and mouth problem during its last occurrence was supposed to be induced by the importation of bush meat into London and we all know nowadays that with aeroplanes, trains and illegal means of transport People, germs and worse travel now at greater distances than, say, before the last war. Now the EU have made us throw away good fish, but dead fish, back into the sea, thus depleting our stocks in our waters. Now, because the French and Spanish have been depleting their stocks for many years, they're whining because this has affected their fishing in our waters. Duh! What are we doing allowing foreign boats into our waters? We are an island and have relied on our waters for many centuries to provide us not the rest of Europe. So if the EU want to kill penguins because they eat fish, in truth the penguins can eat the dead fish thrown back, so no need to kill these charming birds. The Channel Tunnel is another reason why our animals are in such danger. It's now easier to get them shipped abroad and also to bring in the third world workers who mistreat circus animals and who have games of football on our turkey farms. Close the channel or bomb it, I don't really care. Savage dogs have suffered a great deal from adverse publicity. If you have a puppy from one of those breeds, treat it badly, beat it, lock it in a cage and don't allow it to roam or bond with a person, you will have a dangerous dog on your hands. More often than not, some of these owners are not English and don't relate to dogs as we do, or they are just pig ignorant. Actually, only pigs are not ignorant, they are highly intelligent animals. They often have small houses, chocked full of babies and kids, a horde of equally ignorant relations, and all mill around this poor, untrained and unloved dog. Of course, it's going to bite the first human who doesn't beat it. That is in the canine nature. Kids are allowed in closed rooms with these dogs. Parents wonder why these poor babies get bitten or killed. It's the people who should have the licenses, not the dogs. Why are we also putting up with dogs being maligned and in some cases killed by a people who believe dogs are unclean? This could come to a neighbourhood near you. We need RSPCA inspectors just as we need immigration inspectors with greater powers to weed out certain people and make the fines very, very large indeed, as we should do for child cruelty and elderly abuse, which I'm covering on Friday. It was seen that the great British public are also on the receiving end of mainly Islamic propaganda about animals. We're putting up with eating halal on a huge scale because most of us eat ready meals and takeaways Pizza Hut Subway and Kentucky Fried Chicken are all halal. My point being, in a country where Islam is still in the minority, why is halal amongst the general population in shops, schools and even the armed forces? Why are our children being subjected to eating food killed under a different religious belief from ours? When selling my house in Surrey, I had a couple of young Sikh girls who couldn't come in because I had three cats asleep in that house. They bounded screaming from doorway to doorway, in and out of the place, which luckily had three entrances and exits, until I, fearing that I would lose control entirely, told the estate agent to take them away before I killed them. So we had this odd state of third world standards being imposed religiously and financially from both inside and outside this country. We have the third world being catered to from this country, and we allow third world workers to do their worst in this country, who is suffering? Our animals, our farmers and our fisheries. And all in the name of helping and feeding the third world, which covers them in their own countries and then they come over here. It's a double bubble of disaster and it must be righted. We must gain our own culture of animals back again or we will lose out. The third world won't lose out and neither will the world of Islam. We must stop people from breeding fighting dogs. It isn't the dog's fault. We must stop third world immigrants from stealing our sheep and eating our swans. We don't do that in England. We must stop importing third world workers to abuse our animals and pay them for the privilege of doing so. 
We must stop all halal factories. If they want to eat Muslim food, let them go to a Muslim country. We must stop the exportation of our live cattle, sheep and horses for slaughter in Europe, Arabia or North Africa. We must stop the encroaching culture of Islam and the cruelty to dogs. Dogs are a man's best friend, not the method to bait and kill bears by. Well, not in England. We must breed more pigs. Pigs are lovely. Bacon is lovely. And the mere fact that Islam does not like pigs makes me like them more and more. We must not let another culture decide who or what we like in this country any more. We must stand up for our animals, both domestic and working. We used to have the best reputation in the world for our animal rights. We don't want to lose it. And finally, a very wise owl. Florida motorist Sonji Coney Williams was alarmed to find a feathery stowaway trapped in her radiator after being flagged down in a Miami car park. People passing by saw the great horned owl's yellow eyes peering through the grill of her SUV. She hit the bird 24 hours before and obviously thought it had either escaped or been killed. She said, I was driving about 60 miles per hour and the bird never moved. I felt so bad for hitting it, but it was very dark and we didn't pull over. The animal was eventually removed by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Service. Despite the ordeal, the owl was later reported to be in good health and its plight has caught the imagination of many online. A gif of its piercing yellow eyes blinking through the radiator soon spread across the web. This presenter says, Sanji isn't like me. I would have checked immediately I got home. Poor darling, stuck in a radiator grill on what must have been a very unwelcome journey. Thank God for passers-by. They've got more brains than this driver. I've seen the video, and it is a beautiful bird with lovely bright yellow eyes. And the thing is, it looks so calm and so dignified. Bless it. You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozar, and I wish you all a very good night and a very happy St. Valentine's Day tomorrow. Preferably without the massacre, so guys bring out the chockies for us ladies, or else. <laughs>